and hi begin. everyone um today we have another um special vmr this time a special global vmr with this inquiry pool program that I had the privilege to work with um, last March during my Sulbai at the Sinai Hospital of Baltimore. And we have the Associate Program Director with us, our friend Dr. Ravi Singh. And to present the case, we have Dr. Kling Cheng, which is a, who, who is a PGY-1 at Sinai Hospital. So maybe we can start with inter introductions. Um, Dr. Cheng, could you please um, introduce yourself? Tell us what you'd like to do outside of medicine. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for introducing me, Rafa. Uh, so my name is Clinton. Uh, I'm one of the first year medical residents in Sinai Hospital, Baltimore in Maryland. Uh, and this is my first time being a part of this uh, virtual morning report with clinical problem solvers. And I'm really honored to be here. Uh, <laughs> hope everyone gets to learn something today about the case that I'll be presenting. And could you talk a little bit about what you like to do outside of medicine, things to do for fun in Baltimore? <laughs> Since I'm a new, uh, new, new to Baltimore, I actually just came here all the way from the Philippines, where I'm originally from. Uh, I'm still in the process of exploring Baltimore itself, but definitely it has its charms. I, when you're when you're here in Baltimore, I definitely recommend visiting the Inner Harbor. Definitely have to try the seafoods. It's something I believe it's to die for. Uh, I've personally already had and had my crab limit, crab intake limit for the year, just by being here for the past two or three months. Uh, so yeah, Baltimore is somewhere that it's really uh, surprising and fun and will surprise you when you come by. <laughs> yeah, I really echo what you said, like the seafood is incredible. Uh, crab sandwiches became one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, uh, Dr. Ravi Singh, could you please introduce yourself as well? Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to, to today's VMR. A uh, very exciting EMR. I get to uh, bring two different families together. One family, of course, is Sinai, where I spend most of my time. And the other is uh, my uh, clinical problem solvers family. So everybody here, Rafa, Yasmin, Marcella, uh, Dhruv, Hans, Shema, everybody that's here. Robbie's supposed to be here, but uh, is a little late because he's got some clinical um uh, emergency, but he will be joining us later. So I'm very excited to be here and uh, at least to showcase our program and to answer any questions. And we also have a case. So Dr. Tang will present a, a short case. So we'll also hopefully learn something from, from this exercise. Back to you, Rafa. Uh, Ravi, is there someone from the program here that you'd like to be? I see the yourself? chiefs are here. The chiefs are here if they, they're able to unmute and just uh, introduce themselves. Hello, good afternoon or morning, uh, everyone from uh, wherever you are. Actually, I'm having difficulty with my camera. I would uh, be happy to turn it on, but I'm having technical issues. I'm very uh, excited and happy to be here. Uh, my name is Nasser. I'm one of the PGY4 chief residents. Um, thanks for the CP Solvers team to have us and uh, yeah, like uh, Ravi mentioned in the chat box, uh, if any of the uh, audience have any questions about Sinai uh, Hospital, we are welcome to answer that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, so maybe we can start. Um, Dr. King, could you share your screen, please? Okay. Let's okay. start with the case when Yeah, go uh, ahead. You can start the screen. Okay. So today uh, I'll be presenting a case that was here in Sinai. Uh, quite an interesting case, though. So let me just move on to the next slide. Oh, shoot. I'm so sorry. Oops. Sorry about that. Let me just reconnect and disconnect this one. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. And let me just open up the slide that was closed by accident. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Okay, here. So we have a 72 year old male who presented to the hospital ED uh, with a chief complaint of dizziness, nausea, and blurred vision. 
specifically the patient presented with states that he has been uh, for the past several days has been having intermittent episodes of blurred vision with associated dizziness. Uh, he was allegedly symptom free the whole day until the evening when he was driving and had acute recurrence of blurred vision with accompanying dizziness and nausea. The patient pulled over and then decided to head to the ED. Uh, on further probing, the patient reports that three days prior to the present consultation, yeah, uh, he had his first episode of dizziness with blurring of vision in the right eye specifically. He reports that prior to this, the blurred vision has been present intermittently in his right eye for about two weeks, occurring along with some reported balance issues, although with no loss of consciousness, dizziness, or falls during that time. The patient has had several... Uh, previous history of bilateral cataract surgery, uh, which was believed to be remote as he cannot recall exactly the year, but has not had any recent follow-ups with ophthalmology. Uh, so one day prior to the ED consult, the patient had an episode of subjective fever and mild headache described as pressure sensation on bilateral temples, for which he took a capsule of ibuprofen at home with slight relief of symptoms. The patient also reported nausea and an episode of vomiting with vomit is described as non-bloody around that time. Uh, so that is the very uh, succinct history of present illness. Does anybody want to make a comment? <laughs> oh, great. Great job there, uh, Clinton. So fascinating. And uh, I'm going to ask Shema. <laughs> Shema, you said you just looked at the schema. And what was it particularly the schema that uh, I had? Yes, it was particularly oh. your schema. It was like, actually half an hour before now i have more pressure on me <laughs> so awesome yeah yeah that uh, schema was uh, a patient we had in the emergency room with blurry vision but would you could you maybe start the conversation what do you think is going on sure so when i hear about blurry vision like that we have this anatomical approach that can be a problem within the like the refraction problem like the lens or cornea like in my case and sometimes also the rating that can be affected like the optical nerve or we can have um, inflammation going on like in uveitis and seeing that he also had um, what kind of um, operation was it yes bilateral cataract surgery this could have been a cause for blurry vision but he had three. otherwise when i hear about nausea vomiting and also blurry vision I also think of an acute glaucoma. It can also manifest like that, like the increased mm -hmm. pressure, especially on the opticus nerve. And also be aware of vascular issues like, um, I don't know, a TIA of um, occlusion of the retinal artery, of the um, central venous artery. Uh, yeah, these are the first thoughts that I have. So that's a great starting point, just uh, sort of a little bit about all the different structures. I'm going to ask um, Malik if uh, Hilal has a great thought there. I was right on the same thought trail that this could be um, an autoimmune phenomenon. But are you in a safe space to unmute your mic and possibly contribute? Yes, hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How's everyone? Um, great. great. Thank Thanks you. for coming on. Where, where are you tuning in from? Um, from Beirut, Lebanon. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm a first year uh, internal medicine resident here in Beirut. Um, uh, to make things short, I was, yeah, so uh, thinking about the subjective fever and the fact that he had intermittent um, loss of vision uh, that came and went, and then on um, headache on the temples um, uh, made, made me think of giant cell arteritis, although um, I couldn't really relate it to uh, the nausea and vomiting. Yeah, it's uh, definitely pointing towards an intracranial process, and um, that red flag I usually go through in, with blurry vision or the same schema that Shema had mentioned. If there's been a sudden change in vision, if there is eye pain, I get really worried, which could be with or without movement. If there's a visual field deficit, that definitely could uh, be be a red flag as well. And uh, if there's something to do with the structures that Shaven mentioned, the the optic uh, nerve disc or, or the retina as well, or if there's immunocompromised state, then you can have patients that are predisposed to, to certain infections. So fungus, uh, namely candida, uh, could manifest in, in that way as well. So 
uh, right now with with nausea, vomiting, which could be nonspecific, um, um, I'm not really sure where to really emphasize or, or really uh, invest all, all of my cognitive energy. But um, I see Robbie has joined us as well. If um, you have any thoughts, how are you doing, Robbie? Hello, hello, folks. It's so nice to be here. I uh, remember this exact gathering um, almost a year ago to the date. And um, the fact that it's happening again, 365 days later is a delight and a treat and a testament to the incredible work that this team on the CP Solvers is doing and just how tight our connections are with the incredible program that you're associated with, Ravi. It has brought us you and many other wonderful things. Uh, I'm doing very well. I'm um, on the service right now and taking care of a couple of um, very interesting patients, one of whom has developed this rash right now that I'm trying to figure out, which is why I'm a little, uh, was a little late. Um, but maybe that'll be a case um, for CP solvers or RLR in the future. I'm, I listened to all of Seamus' thoughts. I thought they were superb. I think that um, I, I'm very wary of the fact that this is so recent. And whenever it's something that, that is this recent, uh, I'm inclined to study the data that we have before us, which I think was so astutely done, but also at the same time, open to the story evolving before our eyes, giving us clarity in that nature. And that's my biggest piece of advice. When somebody is presenting so acutely, study what has happened, but also remain open to the possibility that something new may develop that will allow you to understand the picture with more clarity. Hey, Clinton, uh, the next uh, Alec, well, please. Okay, so we shall proceed with more information about the patient. So with regards to his past medical history, the patient is a known case of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, hepatitis C, osteoarthritis, and off note coronary artery disease status post triple stent placement done three years prior. Uh, in terms of his social history, he was a re remote tobacco smoker in 1972. Uh, since then, he has been only smoking intermittently, just one to two sticks every so often, according to him. No alcohol or illicit drug use. Uh, he's vaccinated against COVID-19. Family history is only remarkable for heart disease. He said that his mother, I believe, had a heart attack. And again, surgical history, the cataract surgery, unrecalled uh, when exactly, and also right total hip arthroplasty done in 2018. With regards to his past medical history, his home medications was reviewed, and he was only taking two specific medications, Carvedilol, 6.25 milligrams uh, twice daily, and Rosuvastatin, 10 milligrams uh, orally uh, once daily. In terms of his allergies, he declares that he has no known drug allergies whatsoever. Uh, you want to stop there, Robbie? <clears throat> I'll just weigh in with a few points there. We'll stop there, Clinton. Uh, what's interesting is okay, uh, the past medical history with all these risk factors, so with, with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and vascular disease, so coronary artery disease, as post trip, triple stent placement, is there pathology within the vascular system here? That definitely is on my mind. Uh, it, could there be plaque formation? Could there be stroke with the hypertension, hyperlipidemia as well? Uh, remote tobacco use, not recent, so that would even push the needle more on on, on this possibility. Um, but then again, uh, coming around back to the the heart disease, this cataract surgery was interesting. Like uh, Shame had mentioned, yeah, just remote manipulation could that be suspect? But uh, if we just sort of um, uh, sh uh, sh sort of shimmy along the the surface there and th and think it's just that, we could miss some very very important. Uh, diagnosis that could be sort of bumbling under the surface. So we have to explore all the other mm -hmm. possibilities. Uh, any thoughts, Ravi? Yeah, no, um, I uh, I completely agree with you. I think this picture paints a very common scenario for us where we worry about the health of the vascular system with the hypertension, hyperlipidemia. And the hep C is, you know, opens up a, a, an important but unusual connection with cryoglobulinemia, but the ocular, an ocular ischemic event would be incredibly unusual. Um, yeah, I think that um, 
because we're in CPS, it's all, also important to get extra nerdy. And, and you might ask yourself, how can you get extra nerdy with connecting eye issues with a hip arthroplasty? And um, there are some connections, the most fancy spancy of which is that patients can get what's called cobalt toxicity from these hips. And that can manifest as an as a um, optic neuropathy. Um, I only know that because there was two incredible cases in the New England Journal that reinforced this point. So the truth is, practically speaking, this is atherosclerotic disease until proven otherwise, but medicine all, will always keep you on your toes. And I'm sure that Clinton is here to make sure that our toes are used at some point. Today. So we'll see when that comes out. I, I like how, I'm, I'm sorry, I just took a chance to take a peek at the chat group and someone actually mentioned, I think it's Amr Musa, sorry, I, I, I apologize in advance for murdering the name, but he did mention that temporal arteritis, if we're considering vasculitis, can be considered given that there is uh, ocular manifestation as the patient described, particularly with the right eye blurry of vision. Uh, so that's a very good thought as well. Yeah, I agree that that he brought it up earlier and somebody, um, Malak had also, also mentioned that we're in the right epidemiological age range for this. So definitely is high on our radar screens and something that is very suspicious at this age. So uh, we'll keep that in mind. But great thoughts, everybody from the audience. Clinton, you want to go on to the next yes. one? Okay. So after the uh, past medical history, let's proceed with the important uh, vitals and physical examination. So if we recall that the patient is a 70 year old male who presented to the emergency department with nausea, dizziness and blurred vision as his chief complaints in his initial vitals on upon arrival at the ED was hypertensive at 150 over 94, febrile at 39.6 uh, with respiratory rate at, at the upper, upper, limb, uh, upper border of uh, upper uh, normal limits at 20, heart rate of 92, and O2 sat at 98% at room air. Uh, physical examination showed that he was comfortable in bed, not in acute respiratory distress. Though his head and neck exam, the HEE and T exam was remarkable for uh, bidirectional nystagmus as reported by the ED physician who noted this down. They did a further in, uh, investigation by checking the tympanic membranes, which were noted to be clear. Neck was noted to be midline, non-tender, supple with no stiffness or rigidity. Heart rate was regular, uh, regular had regular rate, rate and rhythm, no murmurs. Uh, breath sounds were clear. Abdomen was non-tender with present bowel sounds. Um, his extremities had no deformities, no edema. Although his neuro examination reported that he had a slight ataxic gait when he was walking in. Uh, that's really interesting now. Uh, I'll kind of start off with Ravi and then jump in. But really what stuck out to me is the bidirectional nystagmus. Uh, so um, with this vertigo, with this dizziness, we don't know. There's many kinds of different dizziness. There's uh, vertigo, presyncope, disequilibrium. Uh, but I think we're dealing here with vertigo. And then when you do go through the HINTS exam, so the first test of choice is doing um, the the um, going through the, the Epley maneuver and then uh, then you have the HINTS exam. And on the HITS exam, you look for uh, direction-changing nystagmus or bidirectional nystagmus. If I remember, uh, unilateral nystagmus may be more for peripheral vertigo, but this bidirectional may point towards a central process. And with um, this blood pressure here, you know, sometimes with a central process, uh, a stroke, whether it be vertebral basal or or um, it could be a cortical stroke, you tend to have this reflexive, uh, hypertensive response of a comp compensatory measure to allow perfusion beyond the ischemic penumbra. So that sort of sticking out to me. But then again, it could be that patient has high blood pressure and it's just part of the process as well. And then the temperature. So 39.6, is there inflammation here or are you dealing with a non-inflammatory disorder here? So again, not sure. Then does that bring back into mind this... Um, uh, um, autoimmune phenomena, the vasculitis that we had thought about earlier. So that definitely still is at play. But uh, ataxic gait, that again uh, makes us think about central process. And maybe we're dealing with, again, central vertigo due to vertebral basal R issue or the uh, cerebellar region. What do you think, Rabi? Uh, we sort of getting narrower in our thoughts of what could be ailing this patient? 
Well, yeah, I completely agree with you. I think that the case for a central cause of these symptom complexes is um, broken through the ceiling, quite honestly. And the, the question that I'm really intrigued with is, well, how does, what does it mean when somebody has an inflammatory CNS disease process? And that usually means that they have some sort of itis in their CNS, um, be it in the meninges, which is a little bit less likely because of the lack of neck stiffness, or in the parenchyma itself. And I think that what strikes me is how high this fever is and how minimal um, yeah, the complaints with relation to it. The patient didn't note this fever. Is that right, Clifford? The journey of the mute button. Take your time. There's no rush. Sorry, I think I pressed the yeah, mute button. Yes. So the patient only reported that he had subjective fever the night prior, but not actually on presentation. Okay. And if, if my understanding is correct of his symptom complex, which I'm reviewing more closely now because I'm just so surprised by how, this, how high this fever is, is he was well until three days ago where he had essentially a constellation of nausea, dizziness, and blurred, uh, and blurred vision, but he had no um, symptoms before that. And that, that's very, very intriguing um, because you'd expect somebody with um, this high a temperature to have more overt complaints related to that temperature than anything otherwise. It's also intriguing that we're entertaining a systemic uh, as an inflammatory CNS process without a headache, um, which is a little bit interesting. So I think where are we at now? I think we've proven that there's inflammation and we've proven that there is a CNS process. And that CNS process seems to be located in the posterior fossa as evidenced by the bidirectional nystagmus and the ataxia. So the question is, well, what causes, uh, what, co what does that? I think you might have cerebellar inflammation or cerebellitis or brainstem inflama inflammation, which is called ROM encephalitis, or you might have a meningitis picture. And so I think clarity on where the inflammation exists will be really, really important. Is it exist in the brain or does it exist in meninges or does this patient have a systemic inflammatory disease process with met metastases to the brain? So could this patient have endocarditis, for example, with a, a posterior fossa stroke that causes fever from the heart and neurosymptoms? So for me, I think, um, I think we've now, we've, we're now on our toes, Robbie. We were like, where is this going? And Clinton is <laughs> it's my toes, that's for sure. And I think the yeah. mistake to make would be to assume that everything localizes in the brain. There's definitely a brain problem, but we haven't proven that the fever is of, is of a disease process there. It may represent something systemic that has gone to the brain. That's really interesting. Yeah, I, I didn't really think beyond the brain. The, the, the brain is signaling pathology, but uh, I like you thinking that uh, meningitis is possibly also a play here. Uh, just regarding the the neck stiffness headache remember we looked into that there's been several cases on cps i had that one case where a patient had meningitis and it was very atypical without uh headache neck stiffness and so on so the i don't remember the sensitivity specificity but they're not the best and even this one test i mentioned the jolt test which was thought to be one one of the most sensitive specific tests for for headache it's not that great but maybe better than Kernig Brzezinski. So we still, in spite of negative nest, neck stiffness and so on, I think we still need to prioritize this di differential. Uh, back to you, Clinton. Okay. So given this constellation of uh, examination examination finding, uh, the ED doctor rightfully so was concerned of a central cause or a central pathology in which, uh, given the bidirectional nystagmus and an ataxic gait, a brain attack team was called for this patient uh, upon presentation in the ED. So they did an NIH uh, stroke scale scoring for this patient, which turned out to be zero. Neurology was consulted given the uh, central nervous pathology finding uh, reflective of the ataxic gait and the bidirectional nystagmus. Neurologic exam by the neurology consult was uh, surprisingly unremarkable. Uh, this was after the CT scan that was done on the patient. So the patient was seen sitting in the wheelchair with his eyes closed, uh, but his mental status exam showed unremarkable findings. His eyes were open, open to spontaneous to voice, uh, alert and oriented times three to self, place, and time. Speech was fluent without this orthia, expressive or receptive aphasia. Was able to name uh, objects. Uh, all his cranial nerves were intact. Motor skills were also checked. Sensation was also unremarkable. Coordination was also unremarkable. No limb ataxia, no dysmetria on finger to nose or heel to shin testing and there was no observed gait abnormalities. However, 
per their uh, neurology note, there was mentioned that the, the patient also declared to the, neuro, uh, the neurologist that he has had poor appetite the past few weeks and multiple episodes of emesis observed during the evaluation, uh, but mostly occurring with movement. No episodes of emesis while lying flat and, and still on the CT scanner. And regarding the dizziness, the patient would say and declare it is not vertigo and it feels like something is wrong multiple times. That was verbalized by the patient during the neuro consult. The patient also endorses a feeling like he cannot walk, but he is able to walk across the room quickly with a steady gait and was observed to have no loss of balance. What do you think, Ravi? I'll, I'll let you start. You know, I think that this is a situation that is uh, uh, very common in real life, which is that there are experts in these diseases. And when they do, uh, um, when the neurologists do a neuro exam, it's no different than you asking a radiologist to do a CT scan. And you trying to diagnose abdominal pain without a CT scan sometimes is the same as you trying to diagnose a complicated neurological issue without a neurologist. They, they have dedicated years to this. And I'm not, this is a very common reality for me in the emergency room when I consult neurology and their exam is very different than mine. Unfortunately, in this situation, it complicates the picture because you're back to square one. And you're saying, okay, what are the possibilities? The possibility is that the, their neuro exam is better than mine and that this is actually not a brain problem. Or the possibility more humbly is to say, well, okay, my neuro exam isn't that bad. Maybe there's an intermittent brain problem like a TIA, for example. So don't disregard your exam, but also don't lock into yours. And so for me, that calculus leads to, is this not a neurological problem or is this an intermittent neurological problem? Regardless though, everyone is agreeing that this person has significant emesis. And the interesting feature of this case is that the emesis seems to be occurring without an overt localizing feature, which is a feature of neurological emesis, specifically with disease in the area post trema, also in the brainstem, can just have isolated nausea and vomiting. So that comes into the play. It's also not, not uncommon for patients with ear issues to just have isolated nausea and vomiting and the sense that there might be vertigo. So for me, I think the, the question is, is this neuro still area post trema or ear? we have to make sure in a patient with refractory nausea and vomiting that ACS isn't at play. And we have to make sure that they aren't having any proximal GI disease like peptic ulcer disease or gastric outlet obstruction, which can fool you. After that, my only checklist is to make sure the patient doesn't have adrenal insufficiency, especially if they have a fever, because that can also present with a very mysterious nausea vomiting syndrome. So where are my thoughts? I haven't moved away from the brain definitively, even though the neurologists seem to be. Um, the ear is possible, the heart is possible, the proximal GI tract is possible, and then the adrenal is possible. And if you're paying attention to what I'm doing, I essentially basically went from head to toe and said anything is possible except a problem in his feet. So I've said nothing. Um, maybe Ravi can enlighten me with more clarity and, uh, and specificity. I don't think I have anything to add to that, but that's phenomenal just going through the steps from head to toe. And even if it's not adrenal insufficiency, you know, that just blew my mind. I was like, oh, can adrenal insufficiency manifest like this? Yes, it can. It can manifest in many different ways, but that's phenomenal. And uh, if you want to see a masterclass in hypercalcemia, listen to yesterday's episode. That was just uh, awesome. Uh, but yeah, keep going, uh, Clinton. Let's see if we can uh, uh, maybe narrow down our differentials for the next uh, aliquot. Mm -hmm. So I will be presenting next the initial laboratory uh, blood tests and the imaging that was done in the ED. So initial uh, complete metabolic profile was only remarkable for a slight uh, decrease in sodium at 134. Uh, blood glucose level was elevated at 128. AST is also slightly elevated at 44. In terms of his white count with differential, his WBC was actually within normal range. Uh, his platelet was slightly low, although with differential count, it shifted towards more of a lymph lymphocytosis kind of picture with an elevated percent lymphocyte. Uh, the, in terms of the CT, uh, CT of the head without IV contrast, there was no acute intracranial abnormalities, rightfully so given that they were concerned of a possible stroke or intracranial uh, pathology. Uh, head and neck CT with IV contrast was also done and showed non-visualization of contrast in the proximal and distal cervical vertebral artery segments with contrast seen in the mid cervical vertebral arteries and the intracranial cervical vertebral arteries with a patent basilar artery. 
findings may represent slow flow versus proximal in distal occlusion with reconstitution. However, there was no evidence of intracranial arterial flow limiting stenosis or large vessel occlusion or aneurysms. That's very interesting uh, going through the labs to see if it helps us or if it moves us away from inflammation in the brain to a systemic process. But say if we did consider Ravi's thought of adrenal insufficiency, sodium is low, but we would also want to see, I don't think as Potassium is high usually, but it could, but it still won't deviate us away from this thought. And then you'd probably also get um, an anagma as well, which we don't also see here. But does, does that exclusively move us away from that? Maybe you also see hypoglycemia. In this case, you have um, um, not low sugar, but higher sugar. AST, I'm not sure what's going on there. It's not con considerably uh large enough to say there's um, a destructive process elsewhere in the muscle in RBC, lysis, or anything like that. Now, looking at the white cell count, normal white cell count, um, still infection is a play there. Uh, maybe a, a leukocytosis would um, make us consider a bacterial cause or because a patient has fever, maybe a bacterial meningitis. But um, normal white count still does not rule that out. Hemoglobin hematocrit is good. Playlay count is low. And then you look at the differential, the lymphocytes are high. So does this signal a, um, a viral etiology for a possible conf infection? I think Amir just mentioned HIV, um, but I, I would definitely go through the, the different viral causes. Could there be a virus in, that could be um, manifesting the systemic uh, system? Or could there be a viral infection within the brain itself? What do you think, Ravi? Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that the word viral definitely needs to come up when you hear the word lymphocytes, lymphocytes, lymphocytes. And I also just reinforce that you're, what you're actively doing, which is that the CT scan results are plus minus. You, you, there is obstruction there, but there's reconstitution. So this person is certainly at risk of having a TIA, but we haven't proven that there's a TIA. And I agree with you. The spotlight is to say, what do the lymphocytes mean? And I think their significance is often hard to put in, in value because it may be unexplained. But whenever you see a lymphocytosis, your reflex should be to think about EBV and CMV and whether those are explanatory. And this sin syndrome isn't evocative of mononucleosis, but there is a cerebellar version of those diseases. In fact, one of them uh, featured on RLR where we had a patient with a post-EBV cerebellar dysfunction. So that definitely pops up. The more morbid scenario for the patient is that this patient has chronic lymphocytosis and has CLL or chronic lymphocytic leukemia which is an important part of the calculus because it may open up the world to immunodeficiency, which opens up the world to a variety of infections that we may have to entertain here. So I think the key piece of data is to understand what is the lymphocyte trend. If we have access to that data, seeing previous chronic lymphocytosis will definitely illuminate the possibility of CLL. But the caveat is that most patients with CLL, they have two things. They both have a high lymphocyte count, but their total white blood cell count is also high. So long story short, this is all data that I think either doesn't move the needle at all, or there may be a hidden gem, but there's, there, we, haven't find our, we haven't found our diamond yet. And I think the mistake to make is to pretend that the CT is positive and shows TIA. I don't think so. It's also to pretend that the lymphocytes are like, as if the patient had 60,000 whites with all lymphocytes. That's a very different scenario than the one we have here. Yeah, this this does make me think about if there's lymphocytes in the periphery, are there lymphocytes within the CSF? So I, I think we definitely need to go look in the CSF and see what's there. Clinton? Funny you should mention that, sir, <laughs> because for the next slide, I will be presenting a brief hospital course as to what happened to the patient once he was admitted on floors. Uh, sorry, next slide. So on day one of his hospitalization, there was noted increase in delirium in the patient, far cry from when he presented in the ED and he was able to respond fully. His white cell count actually skyrocketed from four to 17 overnight. Uh, there was persistent febrile episodes uh, around 37.9 to 39.4 degrees Celsius, at which point infectious disease was consulted. Uh, per the ID recommendation, differential diagnosis at the time that he was considering, given the clinical uh, presentation of the patient of nausea, uh, dizziness, and 
uh, complaints of blurring of vision, meningitis or encephalitis versus an occult infection was, was considered. Uh, he recommended doing a lumbar puncture for CSF to be sent for cell count, cultures, meningitis and encephalitis panel, BDRL, Lyme and West Nile virus. Additional imaging included the CT chest, abdomen and pelvis to rule out any occult infection given the elevated white cell count and initiation of empiric antibiotic therapy and antiviral, including van vancomycin, ceftriaxone, ampicillin, and valacyclovir was initiated. So for his day two of hospitalization, there was noted increase in somnolence. The patient was more <clears throat> noted to be more sleepy. A rapid response was called for, <coughs> excuse me, for hypoxia. Uh, room, air at, at room air, the patient was sitting at uh, 44%. Uh, with even with non-rebreather mass, it failed to move up past fifty percent. <clears throat> Patient was then intubated and transferred to the ICU. On the third day of hospitalization, that was when the lumbar puncture was performed, and later that day, the results were released. <clears throat> on the fifth, on the fourth day of hospitalization. The patient was found to be unresponsive and tracking with his eyes, uh, extubated to humidified high flow nasal cannula. However, on the fifth day, patient became hypoxic again due to mucus plugging and bronchoscopy was done to relieve the obstruction. Reintubation was done due to the large mucus plug leading to collapse of this left lung. So as you can see with the initial course of uh, hospitalization of this patient, there was rapid deterioration, uh, very, a very far cry from when he first initially presented to the ED with just dizziness, blurring of vision, and nausea. Uh, Clinton, so, I just have to say, I don't know, I, I am so impressed with how you're presenting this case. It really is so well laid out visually and so well laid out chronologically and in terms of your thinking. It really, I mean, I think you're demonstrating to everybody uh, what it's like to um, present a case. Uh, um, Thank you. I think our beloved um, uh, Rafa and uh, Marcella, who are here, who are also applying this year, um, can tell you from their own experiences when they presented cases just as well, um, how hard and how much work that takes. So um, thank you for doing that. Um, I think just like Rafa's first case, visual respiniasis, and Marcella's most recent case of leprosy, I think you're giving us powerful clues that this is infectious in nature with the rising white count, the fever, and the fact that you called something <laughs> ID. Uh, and I think that, um, I think that the, the, the tension for me is, yeah, I think you have to assume this is meningitis, meningoencephalitis until proven otherwise. And I'm sure Ravi will teach us about that. Uh, and I would just take a moment to reinforce some, a pearl that may have been lost amongst the many uh, that are in access to us for this amazing case, which is, again, when somebody presents early, study what is going on, but also remain open to the picture changing. We started with thinking about eye issues, right? Think, look at where we are now. When patients present early to you, it is very important for you to look at what they have already given you but also be open to more things that they will give you. And the problem here has changed dramatically. And being open to that and being receptive to that will allow you to anticipate that possibility beforehand. So just make note of where this case started and where it is now, very, very different spaces. I thought, Ravi, what thoughts do you have? Pretty much the same. It's, uh, it's interesting. I made the comment that the white counts normal, so still be wary of a, an infection. The fever definitely made it likely, likely, but you can deploy the eye made mnemonic, right? Uh, Reza's great mnemonic, that there still could be non infectious etiologies. But, but I would prioritize number one, number two, number three, infection. But now with a white count, 17,000 fever. Um, we're with with ID coming in and with all of these this abundance of neurological complaints again the the LP I really like to see the results of LP are we dealing with a bacterial meningitis or viral I'm not sure viral is more common uh, but the, with this elevated white count uh, bacterial definitely is a play and this patient is catastrophic like a catastrophic progression just came in with these like you mentioned these complaints that was a a brilliant uh, uh, overview of how to follow a patient that what they manifest with at the beginning is not necessarily what they will have on day two, day three, day four. Patient is never static, is always dynamic. So it's always important not to just 
shut up shop and just leave for the day and consider that the patient uh, you've you've managed to address every possible issue because you may come back in the morning and the patient has moved beyond what they initially presented with so yeah this uh, this is a very dynamic case here and as uh, Ta- Clinton Dr Tang had really well um, um put together the course uh, very expertly uh, as patient has rapidly declined and now we're moving into maybe the domain of infection in the brain Anything else, Ravi? I completely agree with you. And Shema is poking me in the chat, which is duly noted. Um, Shema on her pediatric rotation every day would send me the most esoteric pediatrics case and say, oh, Ravi, what's the answer? And every time I would say, I don't know. But it didn't dissuade her from sending me a similarly complex case the next day. So hopefully we do a little bit better today, Ravi, than I did when Shema sends me Pete's cases. Fingers crossed. All right, Clinton, tell us more, please. Okay, so I will cut through to the next uh, hospital course, but I will showcase the results of the labs. So the CSF analysis, uh, lumbar puncture serology and meningitis panel came back. Uh, off note, the CSF analysis showed elevated CSF protein at 7.3. Uh, CSF glucose was also elevated at 83. Uh, there was no noted xanthochromia. Clarity was clear. It was colorless. Red blood cells in the CSF sample was slightly elevated at two red blood cells observed in the high power field. WBC subserve was also elevated at 45, uh, particularly more with lymphocytes than segment, segmental cells. Uh, with regards to the LP serology, VDRL was negative. West Nile virus CSF IgG was negative. However, West Nile virus CSF IgM was positive. In regards to the meningitis panel that was sent, nothing was, uh, it was unremarkable for all these pathogens, as you can see. And I'll note the patient is also COVID negative on admission. In terms of his blood cultures, no growth was observed after five days. CSF culture and gram stain showed numerous white blood cells seen, but no organisms were observed and no growth with culturing after five days. AFB culture was also sent and revealed no culture or no growth after six weeks. MRSA was also negative for this patient. So uh, Clinton did a great job uh, today, Ravi. We're we're kind of relaxing today and not doing any scribing. Uh, um, Clinton has brought uh, all the data for us uh, to present, and I thought I'd give uh, most of the team uh, a day off from scribing and so on. Uh, but what what uh, what's interesting is highlighted there: patient is COVID negative, so the virus of the moment uh, for the last few years. So everything in red there. Uh, that he's mentioned does does correlate with um, uh, a viral etiology there. So high protein, high glucose, um, uh, segmented seg- segmented neutrophils, nineteen elevated lymphocytes, greatly greatly elevated there, and this is all screaming out uh, viral etiology. And uh, luckily, we we have uh, the serology here, which is positive for West Nile virus. And what what time of the year was this, Clinton? This is actually just a month and a half ago, right when fall was about to start. So that usually, if I remember, August uh, on the East Coast is pretty much the time summer um, for for West Nile virus. Yeah. So it it makes sense. You know, what what kind of viruses usually cause um, um, uh, uh, meningitis? I, I think there's... A number of enteroviruses that can cause HSV and so on. But uh, West Nile virus, we have to think about in this case as well. So, um, um, Ravi, any additional thoughts there? It's a, it's a great case. I had no idea he was presenting a case on uh, on meningitis. Yeah, no, I, I, think, um, I think that you're seeing a very humbling case of what really seems to be like West Nile meningoencephalitis. And that conclusion comes from the fact that the antibody test, the IgM, is very good test. And you might speculate on why he has it. His age is the is a is a risk factor alone, but his lymphocytosis may beget a diagnosis of CLL, and CLL patients are at much higher risk of invasive viral infections. The truth is, he's very unlucky because only one percent of patients who have West Nile get neuroinvasive disease, so it's a very very rare complication. But the the question that you have is how can you have predicted this LP result? And the truth is that our ability to predict LP results is very limited and highly imperfect, but there's one powerful clue. And the powerful clue before the LP was obtained comes with what's called the law of proportionality. And when you're entertaining in a presumably immunocompetent host, the difference between viral and bacterial meningitis, 
there's one feature that tends to accompany bacterial meningitis that does not accompany viral meningitis. Any guesses in the next 30 seconds about one fairly reliable feature before the LP of bacterial meningitis that does not accompany viral meningitis? I'll pause for 30 seconds to get your brain power on this one. It's a good pro. So stiff neck, Amr says. Think, uh, unfortunately, a stiff neck, as um, uh, as Amr said, is uh, as Ravi said, can be present in either or absent in either. Positive blood cultures would certainly be very definitive for bacterial meningitis. Absolutely true. But um, a large fraction of patients don't have it. So about 30%. Vertigo, rash. So rash is actually a feature of um, viral encephalitis, um, but, but it's not present in everybody. So um, uh, before the LP, a high white blood cell count is definitely a clue. Let me tell you this. Most people who are as sick as this patient got and needing to be intubated for airway protection are usually um, overtly hypotensive and critically ill. Strep pneumo, Neisseria meningitidis, Listeria monocytogenes. By the time the patient is comatose, they have severe sepsis physiology. The powerful clue to this case is how disproportional the effects of this issue was on the brain compared to the system. The system needed no support. The patient was intubated, but intubated for a neurological issue, not intubated for pulmonary issue. So the brain is utterly devastated, gone, comatose, but the body is relatively preserved. That disconnect is not diagnostic of a viral infection, but definitely prioritizes it. The one major exception to the viral rule is cryptococcus. So cryptococcal meningitis is again, one of those organisms that disproportionately affects the CNS. So a helpful subschema here is what is my schema for disproportionate meningoencephalitis? It's viral greater than fungal. You have to not remove bacteria because bacteria is deadly. But if you're trying to prioritize based just on probability, this case was starting to look viral the moment Clinton told us he was so sick brain-wise, but kind of okay systemically. Really, really good case, Clinton. I'll pass the mic to you to teach us some more. What else you have in store? <laughs> So yes, uh, unfortunately for this patient, uh, he was later on diagnosed to have West Nile encephalitis, a uh, neuroinvasive version of the West Nile virus infection. So with regards to the West Nile virus, just taking everyone back a bit to step one days, the good old, the good old step one days. So it's caused by the West Nile virus, uh, an envelope single-stranded RNA virus with an icosahedral a capsid belonging to the Flaviviridae family. So off note, this uh, family of viruses is noteworthy for the hepatitis C virus, the dengue virus, yellow fever, St. Louis encephalopathy, Japanese encephalo encephalitis virus as well. Uh, off note, majority of these family are all transmitted with mosquitoes, uh, which correlates with what Dr. Singh mentioned a while ago about the correlation between end of summer, early fall. That's usually when the mosquito-borne illnesses uh, occur, at least in terms of in the Maryland setting. Uh, again, it's all, based on the CDC, it is the leading cause of mosquito-borne disease in the continental U.S., commonly spread by the bike of a infected mosquito. Fortunately, most people infected with, nest, with the West Nile virus do not feel sick. One in five people who are infected develop a fever and other symptoms, but one in 150 infected people develop serious, sometimes fatal illness. So again, risk factors, which... Uh, you mentioned a while ago, sir, uh, include age. Malignancy is definitely another one. Organ history of organ transplantation or immunosuppression, as well as certain genetic factors. There are some studies that also mention uh, gender uh, pref uh, prevalence in male uh, versus female. And according to the CDC website, less than 1% of infected persons develop uh, a neuroinvasive disease, which typically manifests as meningitis, uh, encephalitis, and acute flaccid paralysis. Uh, off note, I did just want to mention that although the patient initially presented with a lot of um, mixed, uh, mixed uh, sorry, symptoms, the dizziness, the nausea, and the blurring of vision are all correlated in the central nervous system. Meningitis itself, uh, by the name itself, is the inflammation of the meninges, 
which would often manifest irritation and pain, which is uh, what we are classically taught in med school, the Koenigs and the Brzezinski signs. Usually, uh, I was always told from med school that the brain itself does not have any pain receptor. It is the meninges that causes the pain. So given that on initial presentation, the ED physician uh, did this uh, neck examination and reported that there was no pain on neck examination, sort of hinted towards more of an encephalopathic picture versus a meningitis picture. Uh, and then for the epidemiology, as of 2020, uh, July of 2022, a total of 2,695 cases of West Nile virus disease have been reported to the CDC. 1,855 uh, or 69% were classified as neuroinvasive disease, which involves meningitis or encephalitis, and 840 uh, were classified as non-neuroinvasive disease. For the state of Maryland, however, the total number of West Nile virus disease for the year 2022, as of October, there are a total of three, two of which are neuroinvasive disease and one of which is a non-neuroinvasive disease. So as you can see, we can see the, the, uh, the distribution across the state. The highest apparently would be Colorado, uh, which arguably has a lot of arbovirus uh, borne illnesses. Uh, yes. And then just uh, for additional learning, I guess, uh, laboratory criteria for the diagnosis of West Nile virus confirmed with the virus specific immunoglobulin M, IgM antibodies, as uh, you mentioned that in the CSF is highly specific and it, it is a confirmatory test once we have, once we are able to detect that. So yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh, Clinton, I think this is um, wor a case worthy of being published in the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, in large part because of the craziness and, and, and the craziness of the journey and how intriguing the case inherently is, but also how well you put it together. Really great job with the teaching. And, uh, and I also just really enjoy the, uh, the, the tone of your voice. It is a teacher's voice, very oh. uh, deliberate, slow, calculated makes it very easy to, uh, to absorb what you're saying. Thank you for an incredible um, case. I will hammer home the pearl that Ravi emphasized, which is no neck stiffness doesn't mean no CNS problem. Um, a very, very powerful pearl that I think this case really demonstrates. Ravi, what are your thoughts? Yeah, same here. So yeah, uh, Clinton's uh, smashing job there with the presentation. You you knocked it out of the ballpark. I'm really impressed. You, I really enjoyed the case. It was just so much fun. And <laughs> appreciate Robbie uh, coming on and co-discussing after an emergency with just running to the room and having to then log on. And it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. But I just still try. I'm in awe of how you just switch on your mind and then just go go to the task at hand and and uh, discuss a case. Uh, but uh, what, what we'll do now is we we have some uh, members of the program and I'll I'll ask them to then uh, unmute their mics and just introduce themselves and maybe speak a little bit about, about the program. So we have our uh, program director here, uh, Dr. Stephanie Sharps. Uh, if you're able to say a few things, if she's still on, I'm trying to find. Uh, I think she may have logged off. But if not, we'll go on to uh, um, Dr. Asha Thomas, who's our Associate Program Director here at Sinai, if uh, you're able to unmute and uh, maybe share a few points about uh, our program here. Sure, Ravi. Hi, everyone. Thanks, first of all, for a, such a wonderful hour. I am like amazed and a wonderful, wonderful case. Um, Clinton, great, great case and for everybody who participated. And I mentioned in the chat, West Nile is one of those things, once you see it in real life, you never forget it because it's so, de you know, it can be. Obviously, there's a spectrum, but when it's devastating, it's devastating. So it's it's one of those things in medicine, you know, that uh, I have grown over the years to respect and fear, so that when it comes, we're ready to uh, to address it. So um, we're so glad that uh, Dr. Um, Ravitej is here today to help facilitate and a little bit about us in Baltimore at Sinai. Um, so we are um, a residency with uh, 57 residents, and we have two wonderful uh, chiefs uh, residents as well who are here uh, on the line um, and who really 
do such wonderful uh, teaching and mentorship of our residents here at Sinai. Um, we are in Baltimore, so in the mid-Atlantic part of the United States, so pretty moderate. We're very uh, fortunate to be um, in a wonderful medical community here. So we have lots of resources internally and externally for collaboration and research. Um, and we've been really proud of all the things our residents have been able to accomplish, you know, both in their scholarship and in their clinical, clinical work. So um, if this is the first introduction to many of you to our program at Sinai, um, we hope that you'll, uh, you know, reach out, get more information from our chiefs. Now you all know Clinton, I'm sure he'd be happy to talk to you as well. Um, and information that we have available on the um, on the website. So um, again, any questions, feel free to reach out. And then again, to you, Clinton, congratulations, beautiful, beautiful case. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. <laughs> And um, uh, next up, uh, Dr. Francisco Rivera, who's uh, one of our hospitalists here. Uh, if he can unmute his mic and also introduce himself. So one of our faculty members. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, such a fantastic job, uh, Clinton. That was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed the, the talk and, and uh, it was a very, very interesting case. Uh, hello, everyone. Yes, um, I am one of the hospitalists, uh, academic um, hospitalists at, a ho at Sinai Hospital. I was able to meet and, uh, and get to know residents from the Sinai Hospital during my training, actually, when I, when I was doing my fellowship at Hopkins. I met the Sinai residents during their, fellow, during their rotations in the, kidney, in the renal transplant service and also in the oncology service. So that's, that's how I first uh, heard and got to meet them. And I was really impressed with their training. And actually, and that was, a, uh, I have to tell you that that was a very, very big part of my decision on pursuing my career and continuing my career at Sinai because I knew the, the kind of residents that I was going to be working with. And I was very excited about that. And so far it's been, uh, this is my third year working on Sinai and it's, it is very, very um, great. It is very, it is very fun. Uh, our residents are as, Excellent, and I think um, Sinai in, in Baltimore has is a great area to practice medicine and to train. Uh, I'm I'm very I think the the residents are exposed to a huge variety of cases. They have uh, very diverse cases, and uh, they learn a lot. Sometimes I, I think like, man, I wish I had this or this uh, from their training that I didn't have when I was training. For example, um, I'm actually a nocturnist. I work at night, mainly in the night rotation. And at night, there are two faculty members uh, at all times. So you have supervision the whole time you're there. When I was, during my training, during nights, I was alone. It was just two residents taking care of the whole hospital. But um, I think the, the residency program has very good support from faculty. And um, there's, it, there's, a lot of resources, as, as Dr. Thomas was mentioning as well. Uh, it is it's very fun. I think uh, it feels like a family. The residents uh, get along very well. It just feels like they're, they're it's been, I've been so proud of the, the classes that I graduated. They're, they become such confident and amazing physicians. Uh, it's just a huge honor for me to work with them. Well, thank, thank, thank you, uh, Francisco. Yeah, Francisco is an is a incredible teacher of nephrology. And he's crossed paths with uh, Reza before, right? At uh, when he was at Hopkins, is that right, Francisco? Yeah, I think at some point we probably. I'm sure we we shared patients at some point. Yeah, good, to, good, to, good to know. So yeah, uh, Francisco is always at nighttime. I'll, I'll see his notes, and he'll go on to um, a lot of detail uh, if, in, in nephrology and, and medicine as well, and. Uh, does a fantastic job teaching uh, the interns and residents uh, at night. So yeah, which is interesting because uh, for the the system, we don't have a 24 hour call. We do have uh, the 12 hour and then the short call and then a night flow system. So there's no 24 hour calls that are uh, anticipated or expected of the residents. But um, yeah, and uh, Dr. Thomas, Dr. Stephanie Sharps had to, to log off, I think, uh, there was a uh, um, some uh, one of the children had a, a uh, swim meet, so she had to log off uh, early. But um, we have a fantastic, I had a great time working along with uh, Dr. Asha Thomas and Dr. Stephanie Sharps. They're amazing program directors, associate program director, and they really do look into the welfare and well-being and making 
an abundance of chase of um, changes in the program to make sure we have a uh, very um, uh, open and well welcoming program that's taking care of of all the residents and also um, helping in the the learning and nurturing of the residents and medical students. And um, Ravi, we have a, a good friend of of ours, uh, Nasir, is uh, one of the chiefs here. I just want to also reintroduce him to say hello to you. Hey guys, I'm Nasser, I'm one of the um, chief residents here at Sinai. Um, I want to also mention that Clinton did an outstanding job. We are very proud of you. Thank you for, I'm sure it was a lot of work uh, putting that uh, case together, so excellent job. And um, just to um, add to uh, what Dr. Thomas and Dr. Rivera mentioned at, you know, at Sinai Hospital here, it's uh, we we don't treat each other as co-workers, but more as a family. Um, it's more of a family environment, and that's uh, very important for the success of me as an um, individual, but also for each one of our uh, residents. Um, we work uh, very closely um, with one-on-one -on -one supervision with every one of our residents to make sure that they succeed and achieve their goals um at the end of the journey um again thank you for uh, the cp uh, solvers team for having us franco one of our residents um i unfortunately probably he was not able to join us today um he is one of the cp solvers uh members here but also our one of the great residents um uh, again thank you so much and um we are very uh, happy to um be here and uh, share this case with you Great, thanks for coming on, Nasser. And um, there are a few questions in the chat, but uh, somebody had mentioned what, according to you guys, is the best thing about Sinai Hospital. It's just, I can just stare at this screen and just tell you all the wonderful people I've gone to work with. Rafa, uh, Siri Ram is here, who rotated with us, uh, Mona Aswad, and uh, Aditi, and Shreya, and there's a large number of people. And because they came to Sinai, I was like, oh, you guys should look into CPS. So now you see them regularly on CPS and they're very engaged in learning. So they, they came, they worked hard and they wanted to learn more. So they learned about CPS and you see them routinely. Ranjan is also there. Uh, forgive me if I if I missed anybody, but getting to work with all of these people. Andrea did also work as well uh, with us. And uh, it was just a privilege to to be able to help all of you on your journey along your your pathway to residency and you know there's 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 no perfect program every program is great and it's what you make of it and what time and what you invest into it you'll get a lot out of it but um you know i can't say oh we are the best program and so on i i would say all the a lot of the programs are very good and successful because they're built on the shoulders of residents uh, amazing residents interns and also students here we we value the students they contribute to the environment and the climate of the program so every student that comes in is a vital member of the team and they also contribute so so um it's a it's a team effort and it's just uh wonderful to be able to work with all of you this past year and uh, we'll we'll in fact have many more students maybe from cps come in and rotate with us and uh, this will help you along your pathway to residency. If you don't end up with us, you'll end up somewhere. And uh, hopefully that helps you to become a, a well-rounded uh, uh, physician. Any other questions? Rafa, you want to field questions? Uh, maybe we'll, me, Nasir, Francisco can answer, to, uh, Clinton as well. There, there was a, actually a question um, prior to the question that you just asked. It was about grain rounds. Uh, can you guys talk about some talks you discussed during the grain rounds? I was reading about them online and details on it seemed very interesting. Yeah, we've had a number of speakers. Uh, recently we had an update on COVID as COVID is changing. And um, recently we've had a, a great number of uh, different uh, presenters. Um, uh, we, we recently had an exercise in, in clinical reasoning as well. And we've had a variety of outside speakers and internal speakers as well, anything ranging from endocrinology to palliative care to cardiology and, and so on. So, yeah, like, as in any institution, every institution has grand rounds and they have uh, excellent number of topics and speakers. 
So the same thing happens at Sinai as well. Maybe we have the time for one last question. Um, how is the relationship with other healthcare professionals like nursing team, allied healthcare and others? I think it's very cordial. Um, I'll, I'll let Clinton maybe answer that. Uh, how has his experience been? He, he's uh, been a major traveler coming from China to Philippines to the US from residency. So he has uh, possibly, a, he's observing from a different view than, than those of us that have been working within the US healthcare system. What do you think, Clinton? Uh, it's definitely a, a, a nice experience so far. I, I can honestly say that I've made friends with a lot of the nursing staff here as well. Uh, so I guess bottom line is I was always taught to be nice to everyone. And first and foremost, they are your allies. The nurses know your patients more than you do, especially when you're not there on the floors. And it's definitely a very, uh, a very nice environment to work in. All the nurses are very cordial. They respect you. They treat you as a colleague and they don't talk down to you. Uh, and sometimes it's just so nice to see people, even doctors and nurses, mingling during social events. And it's, it's just really an amazing sight to see. It's not like there's no distinction that you're just a nurse, you're just a doctor. No, you don't, you don't mingle. No, there is none, none of that here. Uh, we always talk to each other. We get updates about each, other, uh, each other's lives at times. Just recently, I talked to a nurse who was planning to go to Thailand for a vacation, and she was going to update us about how her trip went and such. So it's definitely a nice environment, in my opinion, to work with. Uh, and everyone, all the other staff members as well, even the volunteers that come to Sinai, uh, we do have regular batches of volunteers to come in, uh, even volunteer nurses and working and traveling nurses who I know actually regularly comes back to Sinai because of their, pro their nice experience here. So definitely something to look forward to if you're if you're a very you know uh, extroverted person. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I didn't want to answer that because I've been in Sinai for many years, and nurses are like uh, I know them by first name, so they're good friends of mine. Um, as far as the the climate uh, and and the students you work with, I just want to mention we we have students that rotate from hopkins we've been a hopkins rotational site for many many years um and also recently george washington university will also send students for rotations and then we'll have a large number of uh, international medical graduates that uh, rotate on three or four of the teams and they've been rotating uh, we've had a large number recently at one point i had a large class of 14 students uh, so it made uh, for a lot of um uh, good learning, a lot of um, afternoon sessions, and Rafa well is he well knows the the afternoon sessions and sim sim lab that we do with the residents. Yeah, talking about sim lab, um, that that is part and parcel of the program. The the interns are brought in. We started bringing interns in to do rapid responses, codes, uh, patient scenarios, and also point of care ultrasound is now um, uh, taught within the first year. So. Very important tool that that uh, hopefully a lot of a lot of the interns learn by at least second year, third year. Uh, that's recently been introduced into the program. Any other questions, Rafa? Yeah, I, I don't think so. I I just want to echo what everyone just said about Sinai. I rotated there last March. It was just an incredible experience. Everyone was really really nice and. Uh, um, for example, the volunteers, they used to, at least when I was there, they used to bring us uh, fruits, a lot of fruits, you know, and yeah, it was very, very tasty, very good. Uh, also, when it comes to the nurses, they were really interested in, to see if you're learning stuff correctly or not. And we used to have, I don't know if you still have it, like these competitions in the hallways, like if you can uh, answer the, the question correctly, you get you can get a candy or something like that. It was very fun and you could learn a lot with them. So yeah, it was just an incredible experience. Um, so thank you everyone for coming and I just hope everyone had a good time. And uh, next time we have another program uh, and I hope to see you there. Thank you everyone. Thank you everybody, take care. Thanks for coming.